Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. I'm Janelle Blue, president of the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society here in Alexandria, Virginia, and we welcome you. Today's guest is Marianne Evan, and Marianne is a specialist in Eastern European studies, but today we're going to talk specifically about Poland, which is a subject that your heritage is Polish and my Germans no. lived in <laughs> Poland. Yes. So um, it's, a, it's a subject that I'm particularly interested in, and I, I think you will enjoy hearing about how Poland was and then wasn't, and now it is again. So Marianne, welcome. Uh, thank you, and I'm very, very happy to be here and share this great topic with everybody <laughs> and uh, recruit more people to study more genealogy. Yes, it's, it's, indeed. It's, it is really, really fabulous. I, I tell you one interesting story. One, my, my grandparents were peasants. They came to the United States. They worked in factories and so on. In the next generation, everybody finished high school. But one of my uncles went to dental school on the GI Bill. So he was wow. like the professional in the family. Yeah. And I remember I was less than 10 years old. We were in my grandmother's kitchen. And he says to me, well, Marianne, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I say, well, I think I'd like to be a lawyer. And he says, you don't want to do that. There's no future in that for a woman. <laughs> Oh my gosh! <laughs> but he's also the one who said to me, uh, when I said I'm 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 a little later, a few years later, I'm working on the family tree genealogy, uh -huh. and he said, you will never find anything. He's kind of ah, a negative guy. You'll yeah. never find anything because they were poor peasants. Nobody even knew they existed. Nobody cared if they lived or died. He was wrong again. You proved him wrong. <laughs> Good for you. Wrong yeah. again. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about the Polish people in the Polish country. And, um, and the history, which makes it very difficult for a lot of people to get their arms around this. Right. So first of all, the, the Poles are a Slavic people, and that's similar to the Czechs, the Slovaks, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Russians. The languages are similar, although the Western countries use the Roman Latin alphabet and the Eastern countries use the Cyrillic alphabet, right. but the sound is pretty similar. You can. And the, and the grammar is the same. The, in Poland was uh, primarily Roman Catholic. Their ruler was baptized in 966, and in those days, that's the way it went. Mm. When your ruler became Lutheran or <laughs> Muslim or whatever, right. everybody, yeah, everybody had, was should. supposed to fall in line. <clears throat> so uh, the country was, and still is, primarily Roman Catholic. Yes. In uh, 1387, I think it was, the daughter of the Polish king was given in marriage to the Duke of Lithuania. Now, Lithuania was the last pagan country in Eastern Europe. Uh -huh. And most of the Slavic pagan religions were like nature worship. There was a sun god and the seasons and the stars and those kinds of things. But in any case, he married uh, Jadwiga, and at that point, he was baptized. And so there, then the Lithuanians became Catholic, too. <laughs> <laughs> and Poland and Lithuania joined in a commonwealth. And that commonwealth lasted for many centuries. You'll see when we uh, get a closer look at it. Um, another significant factor in Poland is the Jewish population. In the uh, earliest days, especially after the expulsion from Spain, the Jews were welcomed in Poland. and. Mm -hmm. And a large population settled there. We know how that story turned out in the end. Right. But there definitely is, is a fairly large Jewish population even up until the war. Mm -hmm. And so that's a factor that we also need to consider when we're looking at when we're looking at the genealogy. But what happened then? Well, Poland was surrounded by Lithuania, a neighbor. And the, the, old, the German states all broken up, of course, right. in the early days. And Austria-Hungary existed. And then uh, to the east was the Kievan Rus, which was based in Ukraine, what is now Ukraine, but also took in Belarus and um, a lot of uh, northern Russia as okay. well. <clears throat> so as it happened in those days, the, uh, the, the three greediest neighbors decided they wanted a little bit of Poland. And right. Poland was divided three times. We call those the partitions. We have um, uh, maps here. So let me see. Are we looking at the maps? There we go. Okay. 
so here you see in 1300, you see that these are the Kievan Rus in the gray on the right. You see Hungary existed, Poland existed, Lithuania existed. And then in 1500, Poland, by then, Poland and Lithuania had, had joined forces, one big commonwealth from the Baltic to the Black Sea. And the next slide will show you <clears throat> in 1700, it was still pretty much the same. The Golden Horde was off there to the east, the Ottoman Empire, the beige tan kind of thing coming up in the south, and, um, and Russia up to the, to the northeast. And then if you look at the um, picture at the other side here, we see after the first partition, which was 1772. And you can see that Austria, which is now an empire with Hungary, has eaten away into a part of Poland. And up in the, uh, in the northwest, the purple is Prussia, and they've taken a bite. And the Russians have taken some of the southern part and moved into the central part. So Poland still existed, but lost a lot of territory. So on the next slide, we see the second partition, which was in 1793. And here you see that each of those countries, those neighbors, has taken another bite out of Poland. What was happening in a lot of the uh, early 1700s was insurrections against, especially against Russia. And mm. so that got the emperors nervous, and so they said, we got to get more control, of this territory. Control, control, control. Yeah. And then on the right is the third partition, where you can see that there was no more Poland. <clears throat> so that was 1795. And if you can picture somebody who lived in what on the pink side in the, on the left-hand uh, map, who was one day in Poland and the next day in Austria, or mm. one day in Poland, the next day in Russia, mm -hmm. or Prussia, as the case may be. And that status remained until after the First World War. Wow. It was a long time. Wow. Yes. Yeah. And so when we're doing research in Poland, we always have to keep in mind those partitions. Most of our ancestors came in the 1800s, early 1900s, and so everything that came before is of interest, but it doesn't affect what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But when we start doing serious research, we need to know where the place was and what it was then. <laughs> and so l learning the history is, the history is, is really critical. The history is absolutely essential, yes. And there are plenty of books that you oh, can read. Oh, there are read. wonderful books. There's, I have to say Wikipedia <laughs> yeah. is a, a definitely a good source for a quick look yeah. at what went on yeah. in this place, in that place. And some of the articles are a little sketchy, but a lot of them are really comprehensive, and they tell you what you need to know. For example, if you're looking at a particular place, not a country, but a place, mm -hmm. a Wikipedia will also often tell you what jurisdiction it's in, which is really important. Mm -hmm. It's in the province of the the, um, you know, whatever the hierarchy is in that place, and all the other names it used to have in other languages. Oh, my goodness, yeah. So that in itself is a big plus. Yeah. But yes, there, there is much information available, and for serious study, there are plenty of books. It's, it's great, uh, um, because you, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to place things if you don't have the structure underneath it yeah. to, see, to see what's going on. You know, my my ancestors were ethnically Germans, mm -hmm. but they were in Pru they Poland. were in Poland, yes. in Prussian occupied Poland as early as uh, the late 1700s. Yes. Because there were these colonization efforts by yes. the king to get he wanted to, you know, get the Germans <laughs> over there. You know, and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about, the the German partition. One of their methods was to send colonists. Yeah. to Germanize the places. Right. where right. they stayed. But of course the sad ending of that story is when the borders were settled after the Second World War. Uh-huh. And um the border between what is now Poland, what is now Germany was drawn. A lot of those places where there had been heavy German colonizations were now in Poland. And there was, ethnic cleansing is a strong term, but they were forced to go back to Germany, mm -hmm. even though their family may mm -hmm. have been there for 
two hundred years. But but I think they they kept their German ethnicity through the whole thing, even though they lived in Poland. <laughs> well, I got to say, the Poles kept their Polish ethnicity, yes. no matter who was in charge. Yes, it's one of the things. That, the the one of the things you have to say about Eastern Europe is, we have a long memory. Mm -hmm. It goes back centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, Robert Kaplan in one of his books told the story about in the in the Balkan area where when the Ottomans were finally defeated in the early 20th century, in one place, uh, there, all the officers of their army were, were executed and their heads were put on a pike. Oh my this is gosh. the 1900s, right? Really? And so somebody said, what are you doing? And they said, well, they did that to us. And they said, uh. when? Well, in 1322, <laughs> They took over our village, and if you didn't convert, that's what happened oh to you. Oh my, that is a long, long memory. memory. <laughs> <laughs> and a very strong ethnic uh, awareness, mm -hmm. even including, um, for example, Slovenia, which not, never was a country until the 20th century, but Slovenians knew who they were. Poles knew who they were. The Slovaks knew who they were. We all knew who we were, yeah. no matter who was up there telling us what to do. And I'm not even sure they intermarried that much. Although, I, you know, I think mm -hmm. it, when I look at my DNA results now, I see some Eastern European yeah. uh, and, uh, descendants. But I think in those days, they really kept they kept kind of to, to themselves, themselves. Yes. and their and their religions were separate. Yes, um, and yes. so so with that in mind, then. <laughs> Um, you know, how do you begin to, to research this? Well, the first part of researching is true of every genealogy of any nation, any place, any, any time. You got to start with the beginning with what you know mm -hmm. and go back in mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. You have to know the names of the people, when they were born, where they were born, where did they make a record, where were they married, where were their ancestors died, uh, if they immigrated, when did they immigrate? And, um, you use that information to put together a portfolio of this is my grandmother um, on the Pietrak, and this is everything I learned about her here in the United States. Then you take that information mm -hmm. and you hop over the <laughs> Atlantic and see if you can put it together. But especially in Poland, it's so critical to know what was going on on a particular date in Poland. Exactly. Because, yeah. as I said, uh, I just I read something about someone from a, a, a little town in, in Ukraine who, if she had lived her entire life there, would have lived in seven different countries oh in the same village. <laughs> um, in the same village. Yes. <laughs> so there was a lot of that going. So you have to <clears throat> grab all the pieces you can get, and then you have to put them together and put them into their context. Mm -hmm. And I will mention a couple of places where you're more likely to get good basic information. One is passenger manifests, Certainly. because they came with a piece of paper that had their name on it, right. which is one of the reasons why I very strongly say their name was not changed at Ellis Island. Right. <laughs> um, social security applications, where they were supposed to put their mother's maiden name in their exact place of birth. Mm -hmm. Passenger man of, uh, um, naturalization records, where again, they were supposed to put exactly where they were born and the spouse's name and spouse was born. Yeah. Sometimes they didn't know, sometimes they fudged it, sometimes they outright lied, but you need to look, there's no sense looking at the, hoping that in the death record of somebody who died at 92, that their great nephew knows exactly where right. they were born and what their mother's maiden name was. So right. you have to assess your day. But, so let's say you've done all that. <laughs> you've gone through all, everything you can find in the United States and you think you know who this person was and where and when he or she was born. Then the question is, <clears throat> where do you go from there? Where do you go from there? Well, I, I wanna add that even if you're looking for one person or four people, if you have four immigrant ancestors, you have to consider some other things. One is you have to consider other family members because brothers and sisters were probably born in the same place. Right. And if they were born in the same place, um, if, if your grandmother's record isn't really clear, maybe her brother's is clear. Maybe her brother, when he had to register for the First World War, put the actual birthplace down and not just Poland. Yeah. And uh, so that is something you have to really keep in mind. You also need to really need to know the religion of the person because yes. records were kept 
by the religions for the most part, and most of the records that survived were kept by the religions. And let me make my other pitch here. <laughs> most of the records were not destroyed in the wars. I can guarantee that. <laughs> some were. And some, it's interesting to me, in a couple of places where I went to the churches, and the records that were kind of what I wanted, like late 19th century, they weren't there. They stopped and then they picked up. And I asked one of the priests, what is this? And I said, did you have a fire or flood or something? He said, no. During the Second World War, this was a, a strong area for the partisans. They were in the forest. Mm. And with the Nazis, if they found out who you were, they took um, uh, vengeance on your family. Oh, my. So they took those books out of the churches ah. and hid them. Ah. And a lot of them got their way back, but some of them know they might still be in a barn someplace or buried, and the only person who knew they where they were had died. So there is some of that, and there were some churches that were bombed, and there are some fires, and there are things like that that happened. But the vast majority of the records still exist. But the, the question is where? Ah. And, and, and I know that, uh, that my, my Prussians, um, some of those records are right there still in those towns where they were, Others are in Berlin. Yes. What about some of the other partitions? Well, let me mention one more thing about the records in Berlin. Um, when in, in that Prussian partition, a lot of the churches were Lutheran of some form, yes, right? Yes, right. And some were Catholic churches were converted to Lutheran because as more and more Germans came, they needed more space. When they were expelled, they took a lot of those records with them. But they didn't go to the German state archives. They went to the Lutheran consistory Ah, archives. Ah. And so, and there was the massive collection of, of those German records there. And some of them are now being, they call it repatriating the records. So some of them are apparently being returned to Poland, but I haven't just learned that, so I haven't been able to figure out where they are. So the, when you say the Lutheran consistency, are you talking about that they're it's now like a in big the organization. States? No, it's a big organization in Germany. In Germany. In Germany, okay. right. So okay. it's not in the Berlin archives. It's in the archives okay, of the Lutheran consistory, know. yes. And so on the Russian side, after we finally got to an independent Poland after the USSR fell, because after Poland had a few years there of independence and then it was Russia. The Russians really tried to bring records to the East, but they failed in almost all of cases, not just in Poland, but in Belarus, Ukraine, the other countries as well. There was enormous resistance. There was lying, there was hiding, there was all kinds of things mm. going on. Uh, so most of those records are somewhere still in the country. Uh -huh. However, when things happen in the political sphere, for example, we saw the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth on the map, and that went all the way down to the Black Sea. And so a big chunk of that used to be Ukraine. Right. Well, recently, in the last few years, Ukrainian archives have returned to Poland records of the places that were ethnically Polish, although they are now ended up on the Ukrainian side of the border. Ah. Almost all of them are digitized, and they're available free from the Polish National Archives. Wow. So there's no one thing that happened. Hungary has a lot of the records from countries that used to be in Hungary, Slovakia, Czechia, Moldova, Romania, and so mm -hmm. on. But then those other countries have archives as well. The Polish archive, is that accessible online? Yeah. It's all yes. digitized? It's not all, but they're working on it, and a great proportion of it is. And they really are. One of the archives, I can't remember which one it is, maybe Lithuanian, Moldova, is emphasizing their historic documents when they're scanning, you mm -hmm. know, those ancient 13th century things. Wow. But Poland put a lot of effort into the metrical records, and they are available, and they are free. Would uh, my German... The, Polls? Some of them might be there. Might be there. Might yeah. be there. Yes. So, yeah. you know, yeah. no. we'll have to have a talk. <laughs> always, it's always worth uh, looking. It, you isn't cannot it? disregard mm. anything until you've checked it. Yeah. That's it. Ooh, that's and there's it. also a, a Polish American uh, Genealogical Society. Yes. In, there's a national one in, in uh, Chicago. Chicago, I think. Right. Yeah. There are other local ones. Mm -hmm. There are genealogical societies as well. And because of the way the borders went, uh, you know, some Slovaks and Poles 
intermixed and intermarried. Yeah. And of course, we have Ukraine yeah. and Belarus. And as on the Jewish side, for example, Białystok, which is in Poland, was the largest city yes. right along the border. And that was where the major Jewish community was. So a lot of those records are in Białystok, not in Belarus. I've been there. Yes. I've, they, they have an ancient forest <laughs> there. Yes. It's a, it's oh, a yes, very yeah, interesting <laughs> place. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So um, I want to just mention a few things about each of the partitions because they each had a different flavor. OK. So the Austrian, part, uh, the Austrian partition, which is kind of in the, in the south, and Austria with Hungary, after a while it was hung, Kingdom Hungary and Austrian Empire, they were, of the three, they were the most accepting of the local people. They never imposed the language. Everyone didn't have to speak German from Austria or Hungarian mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Hungary. Records might have been in, um, records might have been in Hungarian, but it wasn't imposed that everyone had to speak Hungarian all the time. Okay. On the German partition, as we mentioned earlier, they sent Germans to colonize these places. Right. And so they, have a, they had a German flavor, but they coexisted for the most part with the existing population. Right. On the Russian side, it was a totally different story. Mm. The um, Russians were, well, I have to blame the Poles to some degree. The Poles kept rising up against the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> and one of those was led by um, Kostyushko, as a matter of fact. But they kept rising up, and the Russians kept putting down the thumb. So 1865, after the 1863 uprising in 1865, all records had to be in Russian. Everything uh, official had to be in Russian. Okay. And it got worse from there. As we got closer to the end of the 19th century, not only in Poland, but in Lithuania and in Belarus and in Ukraine, the Greek Catholic churches and the Roman Catholic churches, the, the plan was to forcibly change, convert them all to Russian Orthodox. Uh, so mm, mm. there was a lot of that going on. And in fact, I, I have read news articles from the time, from 1900, that talked about things like a group of college students in Krakow was arrested because they were singing a Polish song when they were out on a Ex, ex, oh it was just, oh. Russification was the order of the day. Right. So it was totally different in each of the partitions was different. And if you don't know anything about what's going on, you can get completely lost yep. in that. So yep. brush up on your history and your <laughs> geography. <laughs> uh, well, and, and also, um, you know, if you want to know something about for instance, in in the in the Russian in the Prussian part, uh, the king, whoever was the king at the time, was setting the standards, exactly. and so education for young children started there at a different time than it would have yes. in in the Austria-Hungary yeah, right. exactly. part of Poland, and so those are all things that have so to be taken things. into and consideration. And record keeping, and the one thing that Austria did impose, which was a blessing to genealogists everywhere was a standardized way of keeping church records in the, I'm sure you have seen some of these, the Napoleonic form is a big long paragraph. Uh huh. Yeah. And these were like a, a spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Columns where you could put in the data and you knew what was happening. And the right. Austrians did impose that, 1792 I think is when they started. And it has been a, such a gift to yes. genealogists. They are so much easier to navigate. Yeah, those paragraphs are yes. really hard. <laughs> oh, even though you have a boilerplate and the handwriting is terrible. So. <laughs> uh, uh, and making things even worse, when people had to start using Cyrillic, using Russian, many of them didn't know the language. So instead of translating a word, they transliterated it. Oh my! They gosh. took the sounds and put the sounds in their language. And so, if you give one of those records to a Russian-speaking person nowadays, they say, "This is ridiculous. This is not Russian." Well, <laughs> oh, oh, so that complicates that your search. That definitely complicates the search. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so you do need to know something about the history and, and the geography. You need to know something about the Polish language. And one important thing, like all the Slavic languages, Polish is inflected. There are like eight cases. There's singular and plural. There's mm. masculine and feminine, neuter. Mm. And so every noun gets its meaning, not from where it is in the sentence, as we do in English, but from the ending that you put on it. Okay. So a little bit of grammar or some kind of a cheat sheet 
Yep. Yeah, you need it. <laughs> or you can hire a Polish hire researcher. A Polish. <laughs> right. <laughs> we're, we're getting close to the oh, end, and are. I know you want to have a few last oh, words to sum, yes. sum up. They tell me these words are going to be on my tombstone. Because <laughs> <laughs> I never miss an opportunity. So the first word is proof. You can find, and you can find really good articles about genealogical proof. But you always have to remember that information is not proof. Right that there are standards that have to be met, that you have to study that, and you can't assume that something is true just because you saw it on a piece of paper. That's right. The second is <clears throat> back up. Back up, back up, back up, you stuff. <laughs> oh, tears have been shed. Oh, yeah. Yes, I only had one copy, and my cousin spilled something on it, uh, or <laughs> my computer died and I couldn't get the data. Please, back everything up. And the last thing is sources, which nobody wants to think about, but you've got to do it. When you find a piece of information, you've got to put down where you got it from. Yes. And I have to force myself. So if it's good enough me for me, too. it's good enough for everybody else. Me you've too. You've got to do it. Yeah. There's no other way. And actually, when you enter that document into uh, Family Tree Maker yes. uh -huh. or whatever, search, whatever, whatever you're doing. thing you're using, that's where you can you put, can put that right citation, mm -hmm. and then you've got it. And because then you've got it. if you can't, even even if you don't need it, the person who picks up your genealogy right. after you're finished with it has to go back and find yes. all that again. Oh, and sometimes you need it. <laughs> well, and, and sometimes more often you can't you need remember. It. Yeah, because <laughs> because the last the last good piece of advice is you want to write it all down, right? Write it all down. Yes, and yes, then you put need it to get it in writing because for all the all the times we say, I wish I had asked my mm. great aunt, or mm -hmm. everything you know that's not written down is gone when you go. Not that I'm trying to be morbid, but right. it will happen. It happens, and yeah. you've got to write your own story. <laughs> Marianne, thank you so much. This has been so interesting, and hopefully our viewers have learned something new about Poland today and are inspired to start their search. Yes, I hope. I also want to invite everyone to come to the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society. We're at 1500 Shenandoah Road in Alexandria. We have monthly meetings with great speakers such as Marianne, who just spoke a few uh, few months ago mm -hmm. and um and you're certainly welcome we're doing them virtually now so come to our website at mvgenealogy.org and we would look forward to your visit thank you thank you i think we just scratched the surface we could do this all day long i think <laughs> there's so much to know yeah there is really and um